I'd like to talk a little bit about our speaker before I hand him over to you. So Mark was raised in the shadow of Oak Ridge, pretty much. His parents lived in Oak Ridge from 1942 to 1950 during the Manhattan Project, and that is where he lived in Tennessee. He came to Albuquerque and accepted a position at the Albuquerque Menal School, and then returned to Tennessee after his father passed away. He holds degrees in history from the Warren Wilson College in North Carolina, the University of Virginia, and the University of New Mexico. He's authored five books and multiple essays. And on top of his vast knowledge of Los Alamos and Oak Ridge, Mark also has a passion for New Mexico, which is something that I think we all have. Um, while we were preparing for this lecture, Mark on a couple occasions said, any chance to get me out to New Mexico, I'll take it. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. So I would like to invite you all to give Mark a very warm, very Los Alamos welcome. Mark. Uh, seeing a lot of photos taken in this place, I, I didn't know that I would uh, come here myself, but uh, I appreciate you all having me. You know, I never envisioned I would give a talk in this space, so I appreciate you having me. Um, let's start with a couple of uh, disclaimers uh, and comments. Uh, disclaimer number one, as you will see very quickly, this is for me a very personal subject, and I make no pretense of objectivity. I'm certainly aware of my biases, and I think uh, biases aren't a bad thing if they're good biases, and if you're aware of them, uh, they, can, they can be very positive things. So I will say that. Uh, disclaimer number two, for those of you who are scientists, I'm not a scientist. In fact, my high school chemistry teacher would tell you that I wasn't a very good chemistry student in 60 years ago. Uh, uh, my concern here is the human side of developments at Los Alamos and Oak Ridge, uh, the encounters between the people who were the newcomers to these two relatively isolated regions in 1942, 43, 44, and their encounters with the people who were here before them. And so for here, that would be the Pueblo and the Hispanics, and uh, in my neck of the woods, it would be people that we would generically call Appalachian people mostly rural farming type people. Uh, as a historian, my, my greatest interest is the encounter, in fact, as a human being, my greatest interest is the encounter with diversity. I think that's what the biggest story in all human history and in my uh, PhD work at UNM, uh, I focused on that. Uh, so an invitation to you scientists, if you want to try to teach me some science, good luck. Uh, I'll be glad to listen to you. I gave a class for a, a program in Oak Ridge uh, that was five hours long, so there's a warning to you. I, this, was, this is a condensation. Um, and there were scientists who tried to correct me about plutonium, plutonium and uranium and what happened here and what happened there. And I wasn't a really good student. So uh, the other invitation is if some of you have experiences uh, and or photographs, this is clearly a work in progress. Um, I'd be glad to, you can share stories with me either tonight or I'll get, get you my email address, Mackenzie has it, uh, and if you have good photos or anything to add to my PowerPoint, I certainly would appreciate that. Uh, a couple of warnings, uh, this is a uh, work in progress. A second warning, I won't even get to the stories of these two cities till about halfway through this talk. And so I'll explain why that's going to be the case. And my greatest hope, I'm 72, and I've really got other projects that I'm working on in retirement. I'm hoping to nudge young scholars, Appalachian study scholars, uh, UNM graduate students who, uh, who might be interested in studying uh, particularly the encounter here in New Mexico with the native population. Uh, and so that's where I am. Now, the next slide, what about my title? What are comparative context? Well, I would argue normal people, and you all are normal people, and I'm going to call myself an abnormal person, uh, historians being the abnormal people here. You people normally approach a topic and you think of history if you're like most people I know, uh, and you certainly are more educated than most people that I know when I take, talk to general audiences uh, in my neck of the woods. Uh, you're about the same as my students at Oracle and Oak Ridge. You think of history as of the past, 
and you're typically preoccupied with the details of a specific event, a specific topic, in a specific location, in a specific moment in time. And therefore, history often becomes for the layman kind of like a photo album. It's static. It's isolated from what's going on in the bigger story. And excuse me for sounding like a pompous historian, I would tell you that is ahistorical. History is constantly churning. It's constantly messy. And so to put it back into its geographical context and its temporal context is something a historian would do that maybe some of you might do, but probably not so much as I do. When I say geographical, let's just think about Los Alamos. The story of Los Alamos can be told within the story of New Mexico. It can be told in the broader story of Southwestern history. When we get to my part of the talk about the two cities, it will be when the national context brings Oak Ridge and Los Alamos together in 1942. Uh, and certainly, when they dropped those bombs, it was global. And many things that have been very positive, my dad was with the, uh, an administrator with the Metals and Ceramics Division at, at Oak Ridge National Lab. And I was most proud as a child of all the things they were doing for medicine and computer science and peacetime uses of nuclear energy. Now, temporal means having to do with time. A historian always asks, what was going on around Los Alamos when this happened? And it's very much affected by the timing. A second way, which is I think probably most frustrating for you non-historians, is temporal context can also be when something is remembered. I did my graduate work at UNM in the 70s and 80s, and if you know anything about the history profession, that was the time that us young scholars, stirred by the civil rights movement, the Vietnam War, began to ask new questions. That's when black history starts a plethora of histories of Native Americans. When I came to UNM, Native American history, Chicano history were really big things. Now, the rationale, why would someone bother to do this? Well, a couple of things real quickly. I would say telling Oak Ridge and Los Alamos stories without acknowledging the national and global context and the temporal context that brought them together. Let me move to this next slide. First of all, there you can see the state and regional, but the next one is better because it's in that context in 1942 that these communities, very unlikely possibility, they would have ever come together, but they did come together. If you tell the story of Los Alamos, Without talking about World War II, you might have some really interesting information for trivial pursuit, but you don't have really meaningful history. It's meaningful when it's restored to the broader story. On the other hand, if we tell the broader national stories as we, as we have for years, without telling the local stories, without telling how Los Alamos affected the Pueblos and the Hispanics and the rural Appalachian people, and I, I grew up 30 miles from Oak Ridge in a community that was totally dependent on Oak Ridge, but totally resentful. Okay, and, and I think some of you know what I'm talking about. Finally, why bother? And I'll make it very clear in case any of you are wondering. I do not agree with identity politics. On the other hand, as I said at the beginning, I think diversity is the human story. And for reasons both pragmatic and theological, I believe as much as anyone can glimpse, glimpse the design of the divine, he made us diverse not to kill each other, as the poor people in the Middle East are doing right now. He knew I was going to be wrong half the time, so I needed some conservative friends to set me right. And so I think diversity is an incredibly important topic. And as a U.S. historian primarily, that is my specialty is the American encounter with diversity, and the Oak Ridge and Los Alamos stories fit in. So if we go back to the geographical context, that is a, about the most agreed, nobody agrees where Appalachia is, okay? Uh, but we don't know, it, it, it crosses state lines. Most important for my talk is somewhere along the way, and I'll tell you about this, I looked up this map and I said every county 
in East Tennessee from the North Carolina line to the Cumberland Plateau from Kentucky to Georgia is Appalachian. But in Knoxville, where I taught the, taught the brightest kids in Knoxville, they didn't think they were Appalachian. We'll get to that more later. New Mexico story. I, I just drove down today. I spent the night in Walsenburg and came through the San Luis Valley. I drove through snow this morning. It, it, it's not just a New Mexico story. Now, again, the national and global context, I've pretty much talked about that. Uh, let's briefly talk about what I'm going to call matters personal and professional. And I will start this off. If, I, if it seems too egotistical, I apologize. But I truly believe, and I don't know where the quote come, came, comes from, but someone once said that all creative human endeavors are autobiographical. And I know that everything I've ever written about, I didn't realize it when I started writing about it, but when it was done, I said, yeah, that answers, and you'll see this in a minute, a question about my life. So I grew up in the shadow of Oak Ridge. My parents are both native East Tennesseans. Uh, they were married in 1940, met at UT. Uh, Dad was the first person in his family to attend college, and he only was able to do so because of TVA. And they'd let him go to TVA and then work at UT. And my mother, on the other hand, was from, she was the daughter of one of the first women with a college education in the whole state of Tennessee. And she was a classics major, of all things. At UT, she became a teacher. Um, my parents... Uh, Dad was hired as soon as the Manhattan Project started uh, in 42, but they lived in Knoxville, and he commuted every day, uh, mostly by bus. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about do Dad's jobs. When I was a child, I never asked him the kind of questions I would I'd like to ask him today. I know from what my brothers, and I'm the fifth of six brothers, uh, and my mother said that Dad traveled a lot. He went to Chicago. Uh, he went to Philadelphia to recruit scientists. Uh, and in Oak Ridge, he hired lots of people who had menial jobs, janitors and room pushers and uh, uh, blue-collar jobs, lots of women in Oak Ridge in particular. We'll talk about that. Uh, in 1946, my parents were able to get one of the nicer houses in Oak Ridge. And Oak Ridge was like Los Alamos. If you were higher up the pecking order, you got a nicer home. How many of you have been to Oak Ridge? That house is on Alder Drive. And that's where the Semesto houses and all. Very nice. That's the picture of when I was born, and that's not that nice house. Because when they took down the gates, the first thing my parents decided, they were going to take this four little boys, and I was on the way, and they were going to raise us on a farm, which tells you a lot about my parents. And it tells you a little bit about my interest in Appalachia. Because I never realized it until I had to go home and write a book about it. But what Dad wanted us to learn was rural values, which today you could call Appalachia. He would have not used that term in 1950. Hard work, personal integrity. They bought a rundown farm. There you see it. And my grandparents were appalled. What were Gene and Katie doing? Dad had this nice home. He was a big top administrator. It would take me a lifetime to figure it out. You can see it became a pretty nice home. And the last picture, that was my first homecoming, February 1951. That was my last homecoming with my dad. He died Halloween Day 1986, and that totally turned my life upside down. Now, I lived the first 18 years on that farm. Very briefly, at age 18, there was nothing was going to happen, but I was going to get away. I'd lived in the shadow of older brothers. I went off to a very liberal, small liberal arts college, which had once been a Presbyterian mission school. There's a connection to Manal School there, if you know anything about Manal. Okay? Uh, went there, got a degree, made a really bad choice, went and got a master's at the University of Virginia. I went from the most liberal school in the South to one of the most conservative universities, and I had thought all educated people were liberals. Yeah, that's how naive I was. I actually got to go back to Warren Wilson to teach because a guy died very suddenly and they hired me in a lurch, met my wife. It was liberal enough I could date, date a student, okay? And as soon as we got married, I took a job at Manal School. And so I would say my coming of age years happened in New Mexico. How many of you know Manal School? 
Manal School was a cousin to my alma mater. I used to joke when the Presbyterians thought we hillbillies and the Hispanics and the Native Americans were all heathens, uh, they took care of all of us. But both schools radically transformed. When I went to Manal in 1976, it was the model for bilingual multicultural education in the state of New Mexico. I went thinking I would get state residency and go to UNM, but as some of you can understand, I fell in love with New Mexico. I stayed nine years at Manal School. When I finally went back to UNM, I met this man. Do any of you know or know of the writings of Frank Sass? There's a book in your library called The Day the Sun Rose Twice. He was my mentor when I was writing my dissertation and he was writing that book. And he would always ask me about things at Oak Ridge. And whenever my parents would come, he'd say, he said, Mark, you ought to write about this. You've got an angle. Well, I never thought much about it. Instead, I wrote a book about Presbyterian missionaries under him. I called it Of Pagans, Papists, Polygamists, and Pious Presbyterians. And if they had used that title at University of Illinois Press, I'd have got a lot more royalties. All right? Uh, anyway, it was not about how the missionaries changed the people. It was how the experience changed the missionaries. And you've lived in New Mexico enough to know that if you stay in New Mexico very long, you've got to change a lot of your values if you're a back east easterner. Now, uh, my father passed away. I was 100 pages into the dissertation. Uh, when my brothers and I said to mother, the farm was 70 acres. There were 40 head of cattle on it. We said, Mom, sell all the cows, sell farm, move into town. And my mother, who was a lifetime English and Latin teacher, pointed a bony finger right at me like she did to hundreds of students. And she said, Mark Manger, I was pregnant with you when we moved here, and I'm dying in this house. And my brothers all said, well, Mark, aren't you finishing your degree? And if you know anything about the job market for PhDs in history in 1987, the job market was slim. So by Christmas, we told Mom we would come home. My wife said... Well, ignorance is everywhere. We can find jobs as teachers. Well, three women made that decision. My, my little mother, my daughter, who's now a 42-year-old history teacher in Florida at a community college. All she wanted, I got her hooked on horses in Albuquerque. Every weekend, I took her to the fairgrounds. Thought I was getting off on the cheap. Well, I didn't. Brought her back, and she and I have raised horses. I've got the mother of her, the horse she has in Florida and, and the mare I have is 34 years old. That's about 120 human years. And my wife was good enough to go along with it. I took a job at a school. Fortunately, I taught one year at the academy. And Webb School knew about the academy. And Webb School is one of the finest prep schools in the United States. And they never want me to tell them, but Albuquerque Academy is better. <laughs> and that got me the job. Because a lot of PhDs can't teach high school folks. I'll guarantee you. All right. But one of the most unlikely things, Webb School, after the first year, my boss said, Mark, you ought to study Appalachia. And he sent me to Berea College. Did any of you see the program this week on the, uh, the PBS NewsHour about Berea? Berea was the Appalachian school and became the center when Appalachian studies emerged in the 1970s when Chicano studies is emerging out here. And so I went up there for three weeks. Had a great time. I've only brought two things I published for you to see. One of my classmates was a young professor at a college in North Carolina, and he loved beer, and Berea was a dry town. So every night, we drove up to Richmond, and he paid for my beer. And I said, Alan, I said, you're, I'm getting into debt. He said, you're going to pay for it. He said, I'll tell you. At the end of three weeks, by that time, I was seeing all these similarities you're going to learn about tonight, about New Mexico and Appalachia. He said, you've been BSing about New Mexico and Appalachia. He said, I want you to write an essay in my next volume of my magazine. And so that essay had a very clever title. It's not very good. The, the essay's not. It's called More Than Bib Overalls and Bean Burritos. And it starts off with a scene from Milagro Bean Field War that could have been set in Appalachia. Okay, I, I pursued that topic for a number of years, and finally I got a sabbatical from the NEH, and they wrote an, had an essay that's really definitive. It's the, the most definitive thing ever written about 
Appalachia and New Mexico. But by then, teaching my, my wealthy, affluent, very intelligent kids at Webb School and trying to grapple with my own Appalachian identity, I got interested in the whole question of why so many people like my forebears who lived in Appalachia never identified with Appalachia. And, and that was helped by my kids. I took them up to a very poor coal mining community. These were the richest kids in Knoxville. But their electricity came from strip mine coal. And the strip mine coal in this community created a huge poverty. It created Appalachia. And so that led me to write a book that the University of Tennessee Press published in 2010 with a, with a very different interpretation of Appalachian history. Now, what was that very different? I questioned the very definition of Appalachia, and I would do the same thing. In fact, when I thought about it later, it came from living in New Mexico. I rejected the idea of a cultural Appalachia that you define a region because they are low income, low formal education, and live way back in the hollers. Because what happens to people like me and my family that get advanced degrees and become middle class? Then Appalachia loses us. By that definition, none of my kids could identify with the region. And that's why poor regions around the world live in cycles of poverty. Well, later I realized that when I lived in New Mexico, I fell in love so much with the tri-cultures. And we know it's not the utopia of the Chamber of Commerce. But we know, we can look at the Middle East today and know that New Mexico has found a way for Anglos, Hispanics, and varieties of Native Americans to coexist. And I realized only after I had redefined Appalachia that I had called myself a New Mexican and the only way I could claim it was geography. And East Tennessee, if you go back to my earlier slide, is all within Appalachia. Now, do all Appalachian study scholars agree with me? Not at all. The people who I call the quilt and dulcimer crowd, the people who like the romantic stuff, and you've got them here in Hispanic and Native American New Mexico, they didn't like me at all because I was undermining their game. Now, one other comment, and I'm going to leave my story behind. Because I was at a, a college preparatory school, I became the primary teacher of advanced placement U.S. history. I used to be very good friends with a woman who taught AP U.S. history here, who I know taught some of your kids. We graded AP exams together. Teaching, having to teach U.S. history to bright kids three times a day, five days a week, meant everything that I knew in my specialist interest as a missionary historian or a historian of Appalachia and New Mexico had to be factored back into the bigger American story. The worst thing about academia is over-specialization. And by convenience, I was saved from over-specialization because whenever I would write about New Mexico or Appalachia, I'd say, well, what's going on in the national context? So this is very autobiographical, folks. So the question you're all asking, and the question I get most asked most of the time, what could these two regions possibly have in common? And to be honest with you, what I find is people in both regions, not scholars, my, my, my friends in East Tennessee who don't want to be called dumb hillbillies, they think all the Hispanics out here are greasers and Indians are savages. And when I go to the Spanish museum down here, they say, well, we don't want to be identified with a bunch of rednecks. And so I'm really selling an argument that there's not a natural market for. Okay? Now, when I was taking that class at Berea and the conversations that led Alan to get me to write this essay, is I noticed immediately some similarities. They're mountainous regions. They are two regions where religion is a very, very essential institution. But I just drove over from the high road to Taos today. They do not look like the Smokies I was hiking in last week because one is dry, one is humid. Uh, one is Spanish, one is very much Teutonic Anglo-Saxon. Most significantly, I was making a comparison of Appalachians who I define as a cultural minority. And my research in my, was mostly on Hispanics. I know 
Pueblos are important to your story, and I'll talk about that. Well, if you took a continuum of all the different groups who've peopled American history, blacks would be at the far end, and people who are less colored, there's gradations. Appalachians are really at the, at the easy end because people can do what my family did and my students did. They got educated and they were no longer dumb hillbillies. Hispanics are somewhere in between the cultural minority of Appalachia. They're an ethnic minority, a linguistic minority. But I had lots of Hispanic friends in Albuquerque who had moved to Albuquerque. They may have grown up in Truchas or Chimayo, but they, they, were, they were a different kind of Hispanic. And so I knew I was dealing with a much more complicated target than just Appalachians and just Hispanics. Now, I'm not a historian. I never in 40 years have ever asked a student to memorize a date. This doesn't mean dates aren't important. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, what I, as this class unfolded at Berea College, common dates in the history of these two regions just kept popping out. And the one that's most important for my talk tonight is the convergence of circumstances. Now, I don't think it's coincidence. I like the word convergence. One of my historian friends uses that term. That brought these two stories in these two regions together. But that's only one date. 1540s, the Spanish explored the southwest. The southeast. I'm going to fly through this very quickly. 1967, within two weeks of each other, do any of you remember the courthouse raid in Rio Arriba County with Lopez Tierrina? A week later, less than two weeks later, Jink Ray sat down on an eastern Kentucky strip mine field and he told the coal operators, my son who owns this land is in Vietnam fighting for this country and you're not going to destroy his land. And so you have, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, a tradition of activism, of grassroots activism coming from Hispanics, Native Americans, and Appalachians. Another date. Around 1200, you have the Anasazi, Chaco. You have the mound builders who are as far east as the foothills of the Appalachians. They were the most highly advanced Native American people, and they were in both regions. Curiously, both the Anasazi and the mound builders had disappeared before the white man ever arrived because of disease and other such things. Interesting parallel. In the year that the United States was founded, a couple of Spanish priests came here and traveled all through this area. While they were here in the foothills, in the hills of Appalachia, a young botanist wrote a book about the flora and the fauna of this region. Some, some, something's going on here, guys. In 1881, the railroad arrived in Albuquerque, it didn't, Santa Fe didn't want it. Same year it arrived in Asheville, North Carolina, in Roanoke, Virginia. Between the fall of 1929 and the spring of 1930, back east, what I call counter-modernists, who were caught up in the Depression, got really fascinated with primitive crafts. They start the Spanish Colonial Arts Society in Santa Fe, the Southern Highland Crafts Guild. What's going on? Now, what I would argue, if you just, when, I, when, when kids would ask me why I didn't make them memorize dates, I said you need to know dates the same way if you're a child and children today can't do this. If you got a dot-to-dot -dot book, only if you know your numbers can you go from here to there and make Puff the Magic Dragon or Santa Claus or whatever. The dates are important for you to link them together. And that's what's really important here. And so I would argue, for reasons that are very complicated, between about 1700 and 1870, say just after the Civil War, these two regions developed in ways that mainstream Americans would later see as isolated, insignificant backwaters. Now, when, when I wrote this essay, I didn't question isolation. What I now know is New Mexico was never totally isolated. Dominguez and Escalante said it was remote beyond compare. But there were people that traded ox cart trade up and down the Camino Real. And later there were Spanish sheep herders here who would take their sheep to market all the way to Mexico City or down into Mexico. In Appalachia, it was the same thing. So 
I use the word always relatively isolated, relative to other people in the United States and relative to people in these two regions after 1870. Now, another similarity that everybody points out to is these were, people would tell you they were subsistence farmers. That's not true. N never in Appalachia or in New Mexico did someone totally live on his own. People in New Mexico traded to Mexico City and then eventually after 1821 to St. Louis on the Santa Fe Trail. Uh, people in Appalachia did the same. But before 1870, the primary income was small-scale farming. While the United States was being transformed by the commercial economy where people produced for the market, these two regions were not equipped for that. For, they couldn't grow cotton in East Tennessee because it was too cold and too high. And so we never had many slaves there. You couldn't grow many cash crops in New Mexico because it was just too far to market. So these people were sem semi-subsistence. Were they all the same? Our, our perception of Hispanics, our stereotype, and Appalachians, is they're all the same. Well, anybody knows anything about any group of people. I got five brothers. Half of us are Democrats, half of us are Republicans. I'm a heathen and some of them are Baptist, <laughs> right? Are all of you the same? <laughs> no way. Now, what about families? Families were very important to traditional societies everywhere. Because in a pre-modern society, children provided a form of labor and used small s as a form of social security. Who took care of grandpa when he died? It was the youngest son or the youngest daughter. And so families were really important. But as we're going to see in more detail in a minute, it became an Achilles heel because land was, for reasons I'll talk a little more about in a minute, was divided equally among all male heirs. And this wasn't good land to start with. And if grandpa starts off with 500 acres and has five sons, they get 100 acres each. And if they have five sons, they get 20 acres each. That's, that, that creates poverty in these two regions. Now, why did I put this house here? Because that is the oldest log cabin on its existing foundation, original foundation, and my sixth back great-grandfather built it, my father's maternal grandfather. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, in that family, Nicholas had come to Tennessee in the 1790s as a veteran of the American Revolution. He got a land grant, and he was smart enough to buy some land himself. He had 1,200 acres, and he had 12 children. And you females, you didn't get any land. They gave them the pewter and the pottery and stuff like that. And the sons, because we were a, a republic, Thomas Jefferson said, we're not going to give land to the oldest son. We're going to divide it equally, which is a great idea. But guess what? By the time my great-grandfather was born in 1857, there wasn't any land for him. And he went off to the University of Tennessee and got an education. And that's one reason he didn't think he was Appalachian, by the way. Now... Religion absolutely is central. Anybody that knows anything about the Hispanic communities, what we call the plaza communities of, you know, I just drove through them all today. Came down from Taos through Penasco to Truchas and Trampas and Chimayo and many of my dearest friends at Manal School. Manal School had originally served kids from those communities when New Mexico did not have adequate public education pre-World pre War II. Uh, and so... Religion is important, but the penitentes and the folk Christianity, the folk Catholicism, or the Baptist or the holiness traditions, they weren't what these Presbyterians and these tall steeple Christians thought were Christian. And so that's going to be an issue later. Material culture, log cabins, people, adobe. Well, that was a natural thing to do. You had lots of wood. You had lots of dirt. Uh, these are very good flat forms of home if you want it to be warm in the winter and cool in the summer, particularly adobe. But when back east, Easterners came out here and looked at it, all they saw were mud hovels and log cabins. This is another one of my great-grandfathers, six great back on my mother's side. This is a house he built, and you will see later why 
it is relevant to this slide. I won't explain it at this point. Popular arts, Appalachia is famous for weaving, wood carving, music. You know, we are the country music capital of the world, Tennessee, right? And it started not in Nashville. It started in Upper East Tennessee, where my forebears came from. Uh, New Mexico has very similar traditions in music, wood carving, weaving. I just came through Chimayo. Uh, many, of my, many of my students came from weaving families. Now, the big change, and this is the backstory to Los Alamos and Oak Ridge, is mainstream America, after the Civil War, discovered in northern New Mexico and in southern Appalachia. Strange, peculiar, but redeemable, I'm a missionary guy, I remember that, and resilient peoples. And this gets us back to a slide you've already seen. What starts this is the arrival of the railroad. The railroad brought in all these outsiders and took out all the local coal and timber and all that kind of stuff. And so the first thing they discovered here in, in, in East Tennessee, it was mostly soldiers from up north who came through in the Civil War and went home and said, I can make money down there in Tennessee. There's lots of trees. There's lots of iron. There's lots of coal. Well, you may not think of New Mexico as a coal region, but look at that book. Coal Town, The Life and Times of Dawson, New Mexico. That's over near Raton. New Mexico had timber, just like we had in the Smokies. Now, this was a true Faustian bargain. This meant these men and their families could get the Sears and Roebuck catalog and become consumers of money products. They, they called it public work. Public work wasn't working for the government. But there was a huge cost. Lots of men died in tree falls, in coal mines. That's, that is a cemetery outside of Raton, New Mexico. We also, if you're an English major in college, maybe you remember local color writers. Uh, local color writers after the Civil War, you would not know these names, but John Fox Jr., Mary Noalice Murphy, they created images from which stereotypes of Appalachia emerged. Charles F. Lummis wrote about the strange quarters of our land, New Mexico, and he created these images. Why did they create those images? Because back east reading audiences love these stories, just like they like, some of you know about dime novels, about cowboys. There were more people that knew about cowboys in Philadelphia than there were in Albuquerque because they love these exotic stories. Right on the hills came my friends, the missionaries. For the missionaries, these people, you can't see the top part, the Presbyterians actually called Appalachians, Native Americans, blacks, uh, uh, Hispanics, they called them exceptional populations. What that meant, one missionary said, they're, uh, they're with us, but they're not of us. And the goal was to start mission schools because there was no public education out here. The only education was for rich Catholic kids. And Presbyterians started schools all over those mountains I came through today. They fed into a girls' school in Santa Fe, and to my school in Albuquerque. And so the missionaries came to transform these people. Very fascinating if you're into women's history. Overwhelmingly these were women, and overwhelmingly they were single women. And the mission field, whether it was New Mexico, Appalachia, or China, was the one place an ambitious woman could carve her own path. That's a picture of my undergraduate alma mater when it was known as Asheville Farm School. And notice how they cleaned up these wonderful kids, right? They don't look as scrubby as they did in those early shots. That was one of the original buildings on Manal School. That, again, was the Asheville Farm School campus. They were agents of change, but I'm going to argue in a minute, not as much as what we think. How many of you remember old Paul Harvey? He'd always say, the rest of the story. Well, the rest of the story that this, you know, the, the Presbyterian notion and most Anglos' notion in 1890, 1900 was we're going to have the melting pot, and if these people can't get swallowed up in our culture, then they'll just have to die off. If you know anything at all about Native American boarding schools, that was a very, very profound logic. Well, the schools did have a huge impact, but the one thing I learned immediately when I was doing research out here 
was only a very small percentage of the graduates of Manal School ever became Presbyterian. They came back to Penasco and were Catholics, but they took what they learned at Manal School and they had better lives in terms of hygiene and farming methods. Well, these people also engaged in something that every one of us engage in. Selective acculturation is a term sociologists use, and it sounds like intellectual garbly gook. But if you own one of these things right here, you engage in selective acculturation. Because when we embrace new technology or new religions or new ideas, we only embrace that which works for us. Do you know the first thing I did? I got my first Apple IIe when I was working on my dissertation at UNM, but the first thing I did when I hooked up to the Internet, I checked the baseball scores. Because I'm a Braves fan from 1957, not after they came south, and I wanted to know. That's selective acculturation. All of us do it all the time. And so these women in Appalachia and in the Sangre de Cristos who got wood stoves, yeah, they were better than the old fireplace. But guess what? This woman over here is cooking tortillas and has got a pot of beans, and this woman's cooking beans and cornbread. And as I told those Hispanic kids at Manal School, the only difference in tortillas and cornbread is buttermilk. I said, you guys got more in common with me than you think you know. And so when people got the chance to embrace the automobile, they didn't embrace the automobile and immediately, immediately move down to Knoxville and become a city guy. This is, how many of you have been to Great Smoky Mountain National Park? Have you been to Cades Cove? This is the patriarch of Cades Cove. He was a college-educated Appalachian who went home, became a postman and a primitive Baptist minister. He was a champion of modern farming techniques, and he took all these outsiders' ideas and tried to make life in Cades Cove better. These are Hispanic families, and I think the picture is pretty clear. You've got three generations there, and you can see who's changing the most, right? Grandma's kind of resisting, kind of like I am about this computer today, right? The other sociological concept that I stumbled across is something that we all do again. Intra-group distinction is a term sociologists use for when you belong to a group. Let's say citizens of Los Alamos or members of the Los Alamos History Society. And if somebody should say, I hope they wouldn't say this, all of them are Republicans, what would those of you that are Democrats do? You'd drop out. That's what intra-group distinction does. That's what my four bears did. When they got educated, they didn't identify with being Appalachian. Now, back to my great-great-great-grandfather's house. One of the books that was really cutting edge when I moved back here was called Two Worlds in the Tennessee Mountains. And a Chinese-American historian argued that families in Upper East Tennessee, that's Bristol, Johnson City, Kingsport, if you know that part of the world, uh, the elites really created the negative image of Appalachians, that it wasn't just the local color riders and the missionaries. Well, I found that very interesting, and I began to wonder about my own forebears. Well, about that time, my brother Tom, who's no longer alive, he convinced me to go up to Grayson County, Virginia, and meet these two men who were my mother's distant cousins. And if they, anybody could qualify as hillbillies, Hosier and Val could qualify as hillbillies. And they told us a lot of stories, but... When we went up to the house, I had just read this book. And this book was about what they called uh, folk building in an Appalachian community in eastern Kentucky. And he argued something that I wondered about. He said people often build a log cabin. Then they were a little more prosperous. That's called a single pen. They'd build another pen. When they got wealthy enough, they'd cover it over and call it a dog trot. If they got wealthy enough, they added a second story. And so no one would think there were backward hillbillies in a log cabin. They planked over the house. Well, guess what? I took a crowbar up there, went over to this end, and guess what? Wesley Thomas had a hillbilly's log cabin when he started. He just was successful and moved beyond the stereotype. All right. Now we're dealing to the immediate prologue, and then I promise you I'll get to Oak Ridge and Los Alamos. What we see here in the period roughly 1900 to 1940 is New Mexico and Appalachia, again, have very similar experiences. 
First of all, some of those outsiders, those writers, came and stayed. Like Mabel Dodge Lujan. You all know that story. And they became what we scholars call anti-modernist. And they found in primitive New Mexico, or primitive Appalachia, an alternative to this society that got us mired in the Great Depression and World War I. And so writers like Horace Kephart and Charles F. Lummis, those two men are so similar. Both of them were very successful, had basically nervous breakdowns, became alcoholics, and found their salvation in these rural enclaves that they romanticized. The woman in the middle is very fascinating because she went through the same process except she didn't romanticize. Her little book was very straightforward about all the warts as long as, along with the assets of Appalachian culture. These two men were bestsellers. Her book didn't sell 500 copies. It wasn't discovered until Appalachian Studies came along in the 1970s, which tells you that back east readers or up east readers, they didn't want to know the truth about New Mexico and Appalachia. They wanted exotic, romantic stories. If you know anything about Indian movies and you compare John Wayne and you compare Kevin Costner, you know what I'm talking about. I'm going to go to the Navajo Reservation this next week and most of my Navajo kids and their parents despise Dances with Wolves because they say, you just like us when we fill your, your fantasies. And they're right. Another Faustian bargain is the crafts industry I've talked about. Uh, tourism comes to both regions, and it really is a Faustian bargain. What do you think the good Catholics thought when they saw this bunch of Anglos climbing up the crosses on this Penitente Hill? Did they not resent the heck out of those people? John Oliver, who I talked about earlier, invited people from Knoxville to come hike in the Smokies. He pushed for the creation of the National Park. But guess what? When the federal government needed their land, they took John Oliver's land away, eminent domain. He fought them all the way to the Tennessee Supreme Court and lost. Now, missionaries, back to my story. I, I was, when I started off, I, I was a James A. Michener missionary guy. I was critical of missionaries. I just loved poking fun at them. But I discovered in both regions that missionaries who came and stayed, and this is true globally, think Pearl S. Buck, if you all know anything about Pearl S. Buck, missionaries who came and stayed were changed by the experience. In 2003, I wrote an essay in which I defined missionaries as the first multiculturalist. Now, that doesn't mean there weren't some hidebound, very narrow-minded missionaries who, who tried to change Native American kids by cutting off all their hair and calling them George Washington. Yes, that happened. But one of the problems in Christianity today is all the liberals dropped out because they thought all the Christians were conservative. And guess what? Today all the Christians are conservative, right? That's a self-fulfilling prophecy. This man was an Appalachian hillbilly, went to school in Upper East Tennessee, went to Columbia University, studied under John Dewey, came to my alma mater in 1925, and transformed it into one of the most progressive, innovative institutions. This woman was at that school from 1894 to 1942. If you know anything about the community of Tramontina, Alice Blake was known in the Hispanic community as the angel of Tramontina because she was a teacher and a nurse. But this is the story I love the most. I taught this man's grandchildren at Manal School. His name is Alfonso Romero. Um, Alfonso came to Manal School in 1920, was a student. He was 20 years old when he arrived, and he had about a third grade education, but he was very ambitious. He, he wrote an autobiography in which he said Manal School had three rules, actually four. No cussing, he said, I didn't cuss. No drinking, I didn't drink. No smoking, but when they told me I couldn't speak Spanish, I defied them completely. And that's why if you think missionaries erase people's culture, you have too little respect for the people who are being erased. Instead, he became a Presbyterian minister, went to seminary in California, had churches all over New Mexico and Colorado. And as I was writing my dissertation, he was living, do any of you know what was called Plaza del Monte? It was a Presbyterian retirement home. 
And he's proof, guys, that the missionaries had grown to appreciate the culture. Now, why am I telling you all this? Well, this is the context in which the Anglo-Saxons and other people came to New Mexico in the 1940s. This was not some blank slate where these Indians and Hispanics just did whatever the outsiders wanted. Now, other things are happening in the decades preceding World War II, World War I. Our great hero is Alvin York. New Mexico, like every poor state, had more enlistees than the rich states because poor boys could get clothing and three square meals a day. Well, after World War I, the Depression comes. And guess what? Northern New Mexico and southern Appalachia are incredibly hard hit. First of all, the old timers would tell you they didn't know the Depression because they had always been poor. But they were really hard hit. And if you know anything about Hispanic history, men had to leave Taos and Truchas and Trompas and, and go up to the beet fields in, in, uh, in southern Colorado. They were migrant workers. Same thing happened in Appalachia, except for our people went to Detroit and Chicago and the big cities. Uh, land was worn out. But then the federal government comes in. Los Alamos and Oak Ridge weren't the first presidents of the federal government. My life would not exist had TVA not come in. That's TVA. This is a Hispanic group in Chimayo listening to a federal agent talking about better farming practices. This is actually the Rio Grande, and these are CCC boys. And so before Los Alamos and Oak Ridge, you have a federal presence here. Now, here's what y'all came for. Long into my talk. Let's talk a little bit about it. We know that Leslie Groves and Robert Oppenheimer were very unlikely allies. Nothing would have brought those two men together, and you didn't have to see the movie to know this. Nothing would have brought them together short of World War II. And they brought their programs to very traditional, backward, isolated parts of the United States. This is a traditional East Tennessee farmer. These are farmers, according to the slide that I took it from, on the Pajarito Plateau. Now, we know that even before the Manhattan Project started, just like in World War I, lots of Hispanics and Appalachians joined the army. Because this was the Depression. These are jobs. This puts a shirt on your back. This is a picture of Hispanic guys in Española getting ready to go off to fight. Does anybody, can you guess what this is a picture of? It's the most famous brigade of Hispanic New Mexicans in all of World War II. Anybody know? It's the Baton Death March. I taught lots of kids at Manal School whose grandpas survived that and some that didn't. And this is a, an East Tennessee hillbilly doing a jig on an aircraft carrier somewhere in the Pacific. And so even before the two secret cities. Now, the first thing they had to decide is to locate these here. Uh, and they had the exact same criteria. I think it's safe to say and I'll, I'll talk at the end here about a woman who's written a recent book who would definitely agree with what I'm saying. Oak Ridge men, all of these, Los Alamos did not meet all of them. Relative isolation, true of both. Access to railroads, water, and electricity, definitely. Knoxville wasn't far away. TVA was producing cheaper electricity than anybody in the world. Guess what? Los Alamos was pretty darn far from the railroad. And the people that lived up here in 42 knew that the water was pretty unreliable. I'm sure some of you know those stories. So why did it end up here? Oppenheimer. If it hadn't been Oppenheimer, it wouldn't have been here. And you all know that story. Uh, affordable real estate? Yeah. Affordable local labor force, in case of New Mexico, certainly Pueblos and Hispanics. Uh, a lot of Appalachian people looking for jobs. Very similar story is eminent domain. In my part of the world, eminent domain was nothing new. When Great Smoky Mountain National Park came in, when TVA came in, the government took land. And they did the same thing. Now, as we're all inclined to do, they used the people who fit their argument that, oh, we're helping these people out. And they would put these pictures. You never saw a picture 
of Wheat Seminary, which was a place, how many of you know where K-25 is? It's between Oak Ridge proper and K-25. It was a seminary, and the people in that community were quite educated, and the Baptists and the Methodists and the Presbyterians all cooperated. These weren't backward yahoos. The Manhattan Project never recognized that. They said, oh, we've got we to take this land, and these people aren't using it very well anyway, just like what we said about Native Americans. And almost all the people here in my part of the world got much less for their property than it was worth. Here's the, the quote that the Manhattan Pro Project people most wanted you to hear, and I'll read it aloud. I looked at the farm I'd worked at for half a century. This man lived halfway between where I live today and Oak Ridge. I asked the visitor what the government was going to do, and he said he didn't rightfully know, but it was for winning the war. Well, I had three sons in the service, two were already overseas, and I figured if giving up my home and land would help bring them home sooner, I'd be happy to do it. Not everybody felt that way. But, you know, as government is inclined to do, that, that was a good quote for their purpose. Now, Los Alamos is quite a different story uh, because of the 59,000 acres that were here. I think it was, I, I'm not a great numbers person, 45,000 the federal government already controlled. Mostly, eventually, Bureau of Land Management, National Forest, etc. Of those 9,000 acres that were privately owned, we know that Anchor Ranch, which was somewhere back towards the Valle, uh, had the biggest acreage. They got $25,000, but I never did find out how many acres. Los Alamos Ranch School, who had the buildings here, including this building, uh, and about 54, excuse, no, I don't even have the number of acres. They settled for 367,000 and the source I'm using said the average was about $225 an acre. And it was about the same for the Anchor Ranch. Well, the Hispano homesteaders, who did not live here year-round, they were seasonal people. They'd come up in the summer and graze their animals and sheep and all. Uh, those people received 7 to $15 an acre. According to the man who's written the one extensive comparative study of Hanford, Oak Ridge, and Los Alamos, he said that two-thirds of the privately owned land, the people who owned two-thirds of the privately owned land, received one-eighth of the payoff. Not terribly surprising, guys. This is 1942. This is the age of Jim Crow, and we've got to win the war, right? Now, some things in common. When my mother would talk about Oak Ridge when I was a little boy, I remember her talking about mud. And so when I found these photographs, uh, I decided they had to be a part of the picture. This is Oak Ridge. There you can see a New Mexico license plate, and this is somewhere out here on the plateau. And so, yeah, this was, as many people liking life in these communities, it was frontier-like conditions. Now, we know that because of the nature of this project, secrecy was incredibly important, important, more so to Groves than to Oppenheimer. Groves was absolutely just hard line, and he d developed the concept of compartmentalization. And all of you, I think, know this story. You only knew your part of the job, and only Groves and Oppenheimer and Groves' his secretary knew how all the pieces fit together. All over both communities were signs about secrecy. You had to go through gates. I, I remember my grandparents talking about visiting my parents from Knoxville, like going into a military base. I think what is amazing, we couldn't do this today. We Americans are just too averse to privacy at all. Uh, uh, and so uh, we, we couldn't do it. I think they did an amazing job considering. Now, here's the biggest difference between these two communities. And I will tell you, we're only beginning to touch the tip of the iceberg as historians. Oak Ridge was truly a factory town, or factory towns. There were three plants, K-25, which processed uh, uranium, uh, X-10, which produced the plutonium that then sent to Hanford, and then sent Han Hanford sent the plutonium here for the second bomb, and then Y-12, produced other processes. They were factory towns, which mean they needed huge, huge workforces. When Oak Ridge started, the assumption was that they needed about 
13,000 workers. Well, they reached 13,000 by the first year. And by the end of the war, it was 75,000. And most of those people, yeah, there were scientists, and yeah, there were military people, but most of those people, the overwhelmingly 70 to 80% were rural Appalachian East Tennesseans who this was like working for the coal mine. It was a way to get into the cash economy. Lots of young women, because much of the work here they considered, and this was very sexist, the women were really good at technical kind of things like typing and all, and so you have the Calutron girls, but here you have a Rosie the Riveter at Oak Ridge too. Los Alamos, on the other hand, guys, was in a laboratory town. It was not a factory town. Oppenheimer actually said, and some of you know this, he said, well, I think I will need somewhere around a, a total of three experienced men and perhaps an equal number of younger men. Well, by 1945, he had 6,000 people here. 4,000 of them, though, were scientists, and they were from all over the world, as you well know. Okay, uh, the support workers were mostly Hispanics and Native Americans, many of whom, we'll talk in a minute, commuted in. Larger than even the support staff were the military personnel because this was the top secret project. Okay, now there's only one scholar to date who's compared the three histories and uh, he would make this point that I've made that these two communities are mostly different because a factory town is quite different from a laboratory town. Now, a couple of things in common. My dad could have been on that first bus. That's a bus that came every day from Knoxville to Oak Ridge. The bus on the right, the identification is it just picked up a group of workers in Truchas. And I'll guarantee you if it stopped in Truchas, it had already stopped in Penasco, and it already stopped, it later stopped in Chimayo, Española. Oak Ridge had the largest, excuse me, the sixth largest bus service in the whole world in 1944 because of all these rural East Tennesseans coming in from the hinterlands. Were they military bases? That's what Groves thought. He didn't want to spend a lot of money. Were they company towns? Oh, maybe. But the people who lived there in here by 44 wanted them to be normal communities. But normal guys in 1944 meant that black folks in Oak Ridge lived in Hutmuts. And poor Hispanic workers in Los Alamos lived in Quonset huts. Four families lived in that Quonset hut and shared one bathroom. And so they were a reflection of their time. That's not to criticize anybody. Baseball couldn't even get a black player until 1947, right? Let's, let's judge people in the context of their times. Now, very diverse workforces. Well, I, by the way, I skipped. Let's see. Yeah, okay, let's talk about it. Everyday lives, whether it was Los Alamos and Oak Ridge, all you got to do is listen to the old timers, most of whom are gone now. And they'll say, well, we were a frontier town, but we made do and we shopped and we danced and the kids played and we had Santa Claus and, you know, we made the best of a very hard times. Now, the workforces in both communities, again, this is 1940s, guys, were diverse and they were unequal. Uh, this man, some of you probably know, he was a, a, a tribal leader in, at either San Ildefonso or one of them. These are Hispanic men and women from Chimayo. Uh, these are both Hispanic and black workers here in Los Alamos. We got back to our women. Black workers in New Mexico or in, in Oak Ridge were at the bottom of the totem pole. I grew up in the Jim Crow South, guys. We didn't educate, integrate until I was in the seventh grade. And so I understand that story. I don't justify it, but it was what it was. Now, real quickly, those encounters, the very famous potter, Maria Martinez, she became a kind of a celebrity here. We do know a very interesting story, and I can't, don't have time to go into it, that the women of Los Alamos, who were really not allowed to be, many of them were highly educated, but they weren't allowed to work in the labs, and they didn't know at all what their husbands did. Well, they hired maids from San Ildefonso or the Hispanic villages. They became very fascinated. Americans, by the 1940s, the Indians were flat out defeated, and so we had, we had begun to romanticize them. We were on the road to Kevin Costner, in other words. And so we know that. We know that lots of the outsiders love to talk to the old timers at Oak Ridge because the old timers were storytellers, guys. You can tell from listening to me. And then you 
have the black community. Now, when the news came first from Trinity, and my friend Frank wrote the definitive book on that, and then the news came from Hiroshima, there was a tremendous, as you all well know, sense of triumph and a sense of uncertainty. Yeah, we had helped to win the war, as this very famous photograph says. And yet, the Japanese started it. As Truman said, this was re re return for Pearl Harbor. But when people began to learn about Hiroshima, as you well know, Oppenheimer, and I grew up with a man who worked at Oak Ridge who was here in Los Alamos in 44, 45. He became one of the pacifist scientists that uh, Oppenheimer was a part of. Uh, the other uncertainty was, would these communities survive? They were wartime temporary units. Well, I would take, and I'm really getting into the much bigger story here. In the cold, it's the Cold War that saved these communities. Los Alamos was going to shut down, guys. Oak Ridge was going to shut down. Well, Mr. Trump and his followers would tell you that America became great. And that is right. The world that most people think about was the great America was 45 to 75. Oak Ridge and Los Alamos were in the middle of this. We had an increased global role. Both Oak Ridge and Los Alamos played essential roles. The federal government greatly extended its powers. You know, Franklin D. was just temporary, not Lyndon Johnson permanent. Uh, welfare state. It, we even had the civil rights movement. Oak Ridge and Los Alamos are in the middle of this. But by the 1970s, this is the history I was coming of age as a college student in Manal, and people like Jimmy Carter told us we had to face limits. Well, that wasn't really good news for these cities that needed federal money to keep, keep them going. And even though we won the Cold War, we know and I, don't, I was not here. I had moved back to Tennessee by the time the Cold War was over. Oak Ridge began to shrink. I lived in a bedroom community. It began to diminish. We didn't have money to finish the interstate. We didn't have money for a lot of things. But there's a fourth great departure, and I'll let you hang on that one for a second, and I'll come back to it. Really quickly, this is the world you all know. We know that both Oak Ridge and Los Alamos, and I'm basing this on published scholarship, there was always a desire for normalcy, but also a desire to keep the federal money coming in. And if you have normalcy, it means you can't have government subsidized rent and government subsidized everything. And so there's a lot of mixed feelings here. Uh, at least John Hunter, who is a Los Alamos native who wrote a book under my mentor at the University of New Mexico, John Hunter says that many people in Los Alamos didn't want the fence to come down because they didn't want all these foreigners from down in Espanola coming up here. Uh, same was true in Oak Ridge. They created the Atomic Energy Commission. That's who my dad worked for when I was a little boy. Uh, to, to take it out of military hands with people who disagree about how good that worked. I was most proud because my dad worked mostly in, and he was a personnel guy, he worked in peacetime uses of nuclear energy. Now, John Hunter some of you I know know him. John Hunter, who grew up here, says by the 1950s, Los Alamos thought of itself as an atomic utopia. Because with the federal money permanently, this was the most prosperous city in New Mexico. And I don't have the statistics to share with you, but the, the average income up here was dozens of times more than it was down in Pulwaki. Okay? And these communities developed outstanding public schools. You all know that. In Oak Ridge, they didn't call it atomic utopia. They called it Oak Ridgedness. <laughs> and one of the things, both of these communities, in their outstanding public schools, they were ahead of the rest of the country. Oak Ridge integrated when I was in the first grade. I lived the next county over. I was the seventh grade before we integrated. But the people who weren't living in these two communities didn't think as highly of us as we did. Lots of people in East Tennessee, from Knoxville, but particularly the rural communities, deeply resented Oak Ridge. And I guarantee you, there are some people who don't live very far from here who, who weren't as fond of Los Alamos as Los Alamosans were. And that's just the truth of the matter. Now, in Oak Ridge, we had a real comeuppance. And I'm very curious if you had anything like this in Los Alamos, because I've never found it. 
Margaret Mead, the very famous anthropologist, very strident feminist, very much a globalist, very much a sign of that idealistic side of the 60s. She came to Oak Ridge and lambasted Oak Ridgers. She said, you have all this money and you send all your kids to Harvard and, and, and you serve yourself. And what about these poor Appalachians up here living in strip mining country? The ones that Lyndon Johnson had discovered with the war on poverty. Well, that really shook Oak Ridge up. And Oak Ridgers will tell you today, and I've taught this class, this lecture in a class to Oak Ridgers, they'll say, yeah, we had to do some real serious thinking. Well, I would argue by the time I came to New Mexico in 76, you people up here had kind of had the 60s bash you over the head too. The civil rights movement, the Vietnam War. And it really changes these communities. I assume Margaret Mead never came here though, right? Does anybody know? I don't think she did. She came to Knoxville three times, Oak Ridge and Knoxville. Now, in the time that I'm talking about, the 1950s and 60s into the 70s, both northern New Mexico and southern Appalachia were very parts of them, the remote regions. In my part of the world, the coal mining regions where strip mining was common. That's where Lyndon Johnson starts the war on poverty. This is a home somewhere up in the Sangre de Cristos, and you could have seen this in Appalachia. No longer did people live in log cabins. They lived in house trailers. Mora County, when I moved to New Mexico, was the poorest county, one of the five poorest counties in the whole United States. When their courthouse burned, that was the Mora County courthouse. Yet down here in Santa Fe and Albuquerque and Knoxville and Oak Ridge, wealthy people who wanted to live in Adobe homes, built million dollar mud homes. Think Santa Fe. You could build a log home in East Tennessee and have your computer in it, your color TV. And so lots of contradictions are going on as the history of these communities are going on. People fought back against strip mining, uh, against people taking water rights and uh, land rights from Hispanics. That's where John Nichols got the story from Milagro being filled war. And you have the two men within a week of each other. Now, I'm almost in, folks. The fourth great departure was coming out, and this is my field. Scholars in the 1970s began to view American history differently. People, both black and white historians who were influenced by the civil rights movement, wrote the new black history. And they found that yes, slavery was horrible, but they found that blacks had agency and were able to have some control, and particularly after emancipation, that even though it took 100 years, black history got taken over in Hispanic history. The precursor in this field, long before I came here, was a guy named George Sanchez, who was in the New Mexico Department of Education. And he taught Hispanic kids, like my forebears at Manal School in the 50s and 60s, you ought to be proud of your culture. In Appalachia, a guy named Cratus Williams did it. Those men produced Rudolfo Anaya. To me, bless me, Ulta, if I had to pick one of the five greatest American novels of all time, I would put Rudolfo Anaya. I knew Rudolfo in Albuquerque. Jim Wayne Miller was one of my champions. When he learned I was comparing Appalachia and New Mexico, he said, Mark, you really need to do that. We have the historical societies, the Appalachian studies. Now, guess what? All of this I'm telling you about, I could not have given this lecture 20 years ago. Because every one of these books, and there's not the, they're not the only ones I've used, came out of the new scholarship. If you're into oral history, these are our voices. Los Alamos Revisited, that one came out in 86. This one only a few years ago. Oral history is great because that's the common people talking. Atomic Spaces compares the three communities. My professor Frank had the definitive study of this one. His graduate student, Hunter, wrote that. Two UT professors in the year I moved back to Tennessee wrote the first really solid history of Oak Ridge. If you're into women's history, you need to read The Girls of the Atomic City. And so what has happened, the final similarity is these two regions that had been overlooked, these two regions that we thought were going to get swallowed into the American mainstream did not. They resisted it. Now, two recent books. Do any of you know Mariah Gomez? Mariah Gomez. 
Do you know that book? Any of you have seen it? It's a very controversial book. I know Mariah. She uh, is uh, next door off to the office to Frank Saz's daughter in the American Studies Department at UNM. That is a very strident book. But it's a book that needed to be written because if we want the whole story, we need the other side. Now, my hope is younger Chicano scholars will do what Appalachian scholars like myself have done. I'm not the strident activist that the original Appalachian Studies scholars, I'm more balanced. In Oak Ridge, what's really fascinating, and I don't have time to explain this, but Appalachian Studies scholars have totally ignored Oak Ridge. Now, Appalachian Studies scholars have lambasted TVA. They've lambasted the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. They've totally left Oak Ridge alone. And I think the reason is, is they haven't read my book. <laughs> because they don't know how to deal with Appalachians who don't fit the stereotypes. The best recent book, and this book could be written about Los Alamos, and I only know this woman by email. She's a sociologist at one of the New York universities. Her grandparents were truly Appalachians who moved to Oak Ridge. Her m grandmother was from Cock County. And her grandfather was from a county in North Carolina just across. That was as rural of Appalachia as you've ever could see. They came to Oak Ridge. He was a courier. They had a middle class lifestyle. They do not think of themselves as Appalachian. What she has found is her grandparents' generation are incredibly nostalgic. Because the good old days were back during the war and the heydays of the Cold War. And now we're in this uncertain world where we don't know if Oak Ridge is going to get enough funding or Los Alamos. And so what is the response? Well, I used to have a poster in my classroom and it said, Nostalgia makes the past perfect and the present tense. <laughs> and I'll bet you you got a bad case of nostalgia in Los Alamos. I don't know it for sure. You can tell me whether you do or not. And so there's a final similarity. And so, all I would say, guys, if nothing else, doing this project has kept me out of a lot of trouble, and I spent a lot of time reading books and writing things, uh, and I hope some people find it a little bit interesting and worthwhile. What, what questions do you have, or, or observations, or rebuttals? I, I'm prepared for all of them. Yes? It's like everything in life. It's very unpredictable. I was interested in coming out as an undergraduate in Latin American history. I studied in Mexico City my junior year. Um, and when I went and did my master's degree at the University of Virginia, I knew nothing about searching for graduate schools. Well, their two worst professors were their Latin Americanists. So when I went back and went to my alma mater and taught and met my wife, I decided, well, I'm going to go to the best university for Mexican history. I didn't want to go to Texas at Austin because it's too big. I didn't want to go to Wisconsin because it was too cold. And so it was either UNM or Tulane. Well, UNM beat Tulane for two reasons. One, it's a state school, and I could work one year at Manal School and get state residency. And my wife did not like the humidity in New Orleans, and so we came to New Mexico. I found out very quickly that the Latin Americanist I wanted to study with was not an easy guy you know, if you, any of you that have PhDs, you know a lot of people are ABD because they got a lousy mentor. I wouldn't have finished mine had I not known Frank Saz. Frank Saz convinced me to become an American cultural historian, a historian in the Southwest, and I've never looked back. So I came, but I ended up staying for reasons that weren't why I came. I came to study Latin American history. I really envisioned myself in the diplomatic corps in Mexico City or somewhere. And as I always love to tell my rich and privileged kids at web school, no, I did not plan to teach you. Uh, it is a pure accident of history. We, we Presbyterians, we call it predestination. I think it's closer to plain dumb luck, though. <laughs> so that's my answer to your question. And uh, I, I will never be the same. Living in New Mexico, people that read everything I've written about Appalachia, they'll say, that's Appalachia through New Mexico. Other questions? What did I leave out that I need to tell about Los Alamos? I'm sure I left something out. 
we historians don't find, write the final definitive works ever. Yes, sir. Yeah. Because you were what to like two years before us. Right, right. In this position. Yeah. And so, you know, So you can blame us for everything that went wrong, right? Yeah, that's, right. <laughs> that's good. Everybody needs somebody to blame, right? But it, it was just, that's how I learned the name Oak Ridge as a little kid. Yeah. Because all of that it came up so well, let me tell you one other thing that I, I skipped over. You know, when I was talking about the idea of the atomic utopia. I think what's most commendable about Los Alamos and Oak Ridge is that compared to most of the rest of the world, they dealt with diversity pretty well. Now, we didn't deal with blacks very well. But overall, compared to the rest of society and the rest of human history. But my greatest memory of Oak Ridge, and here's this really precocious little kid who always asked hard questions to his daddy. My dad was an administrator, and he hired lots of people from India, Pakistan, Japan, all over the world. And every Sunday they would come to our house for dinner. And my mother was used to feeding six boys, so she just doubled the soup mix. And we had these people, and because my dad was my dad was a very devout but totally unorthodox guy. I mean, the Baptists in East Tennessee are sure he's in hell right now. Just because of the questions he asked. But I would listen to my dad and talk to Hindus and Buddhists. And much of what I am came from from that exposure to diversity that you all had here too, right? You had lots of international scientists. And for me personally, that is the greatest impact of Oak Ridge on my life. Anything else? Well, I've taken far more of your time than I was supposed to. Uh, I, I'll tell you one more story. Do any of you know any Manal School graduates? Well, there was a wonderful English teacher. Do you? My dead uncle. Your dead uncle. That's way back then, right? Yes. Well, when I was there, I was one of the two more popular teachers, but the most popular teacher was an English teacher who made kids learn vocabulary. And then they had to put the words into sentences. The kids who learned the word loquacious, which means verbose, would always write, Mr. Banker is loquacious. <laughs> so you're not the first person to have to suffer from my bad habits. I thank your attentiveness and uh, appreciate you.